Wait, well, but he shouldn't have had it. He had 50. Oh, yeah. I don't know how you get them all. What in Nevada, you just carry a man. Rules Committee will come to order, and thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to, in just a few minutes, uh, have more of our members that are here, and I've asked the uh, gentleman, Mr. Collins, uh, when he uh, arrives, and he has, if he would um, engage the committee just for a moment. As we know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Collins is uh, in the United States Air Force Reserves and a chaplain. He's here at the Rules Committee, and I would ask that he would lead us in a prayer for our nation and unity of our people in honor of the sorrow that took place in Nevada. Gentlemen, recognized. Let us pray. Eternal God, there's many things that we come to this room and talk about. We come to talk about policy. We come to talk about decisions. We come to talk about the things that are made in this room, and we ask for your guidance. But Father, there's also times when we come as humans who are suffering. And Father, over the last in our country today, again, highlights the suffering for those in Las Vegas, for those that are wounded, for those that have lost loved ones, for those that have responded. As it continues, Father, as we look around also in this room, as we have also, our heart goes to them, we also look to our nation in Texas, Florida, Georgia, the Southeast, Louisiana, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. For disasters of all kinds have left us many times wondering and asking why. But I believe that you've asked us to ask more than why and to say what, and I pray for discernment for our country. I pray for discernment for each and every one to look at the moment and say, not what of anything else, but what can I do? That we reach out as the people I believe we are called to be to help, to care, and to love. And when we're not sure, I pray that each person in this country and around the world would simply take a moment and, Father, reflect on the goodness that we have, that we may be a vessel of that goodness to those that are hurting, those that are grieving, and especially for the body here, that we make decisions that are based on the discernment that you have given us, and that we see this country as a light to the world, and the world come together during these times of tragedy, but also of hope as we look forward. We just ask these things, for it is in your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank the gentleman. Um, I am no different than anyone else in this body and really in this world, and we all have ideas and thoughts, and I'd like to defer to the gentlewoman uh, from New York for any comments that she'd like thank to you. make. Yes, I really appreciate yes, that. I. I really feel compelled to do it. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to recognize the horrific event that unfolded late last night in Las Vegas, where a gunman opened fire at a crowd of concert goers and killed at least 58 and wounded more than 500. We have no idea why. He thought that was the thing he wanted to do. But more than 500 rushed to hospitals, totals that local officials expect will rise as we learn more. But this is already the worst mass shooting in the modern United States history. In this case, the crowd was able to hear the gunshots and many were able to run toward safety. It is unfathomable to think about what could have happened had the shooter used a silencer. The gun lobby, working with its allies in Congress, is actually working right now to advance a bill called the SHARE Act that would make silencers easier to buy, I guess to protect the ears of the mass killer, I assume. But I would certainly ask that as we debate that, that we try to give at least a fighting chance to the victims and that the first responders would have a chance to find where the shots are coming from. About a decade and a half ago, I think I procured for the police department in Rochester and Buffalo a system called Shot Spotter, which within seconds informs the police department of a shooting in high crime areas. It is so sensitive that they can tell if the gunshot came from the passenger side or the driver's side. And in many cases, they are able to get to the scene of that shooting before the perpetrators leave. 
They couldn't do that at all if all guns had silencers. I think easier access to silencers is one of the last few things on the wish list that it hasn't already gotten from Congress because everything it wants, it gets. They're trying to pass this bill by claiming the sound of gunshots hurts the shooter's ears. Now what about innocent victims that could be in the sights of a madman with a gun? The children like we saw with Sandy Hook or concert goers like we saw last night, if the streets of America are going to be turned into a virtual war zone, please give us a fighting chance to know where our deaths are coming from. The tragedy in Las Vegas should know every, show every one of us the dangers of passing the bill, and I hope it never comes to the floor of the House. Because members of Congress are in a very unique position. We're legislators. Unlike members of the clergy or the grief counselors, we're in a position to do more than offer con uh, condolences and to help people work through their pain. We have the chance to do something about gun violence epidemic that is tearing our country apart. Many Americans saw this terrible news before breakfast this morning. If we wanted to, this chamber could have started to take action to prevent the next mass shooting before families sat down for dinner tonight. But now it's past five o'clock and I'm sure we won't. The Congressional Research Service estimates that there are more than 300 million guns in America today for a country of 323 million people. The United States stands alone as the only country on the face of the earth to constantly see these large-scale shootings. Our nation has now reached the point where people can't go to church, the movie theater, a concert, elementary school, anywhere without the fear of gun violence. After the mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, when the victims were five and six years old, we swore that that would never happen again, never, never again. And I believe that because many of us as parents and grandparents couldn't even fathom the notion that those little children in Newtown, Connecticut could not go home, you know, come back home from going to school that morning. But Congress has stood by as acts of gun violence have happened over and over again. Even bipartisan measures to strengthen our background check system and keep people on the terrorist watch list and on the no-fly list, the two things it should be the easiest things in the world for us to do if you're on a list as a terrorist and you should not be on, on the fly list or to be able to purchase firearms. But they do. And how many of the persons who commit these mass murders we find we think are not quite mentally able to handle guns, and yet they do. And why are assault weapons on the street? 90% of the public doesn't want them there. Some have suggested that when Congress failed to act after those 20 children, those tiny little persons just before Christmas lost their lives at Sandy Hook, that the fight to combat gun violence was lost. Millions of families today hope that they are wrong. It's past time for us to get some backbone here and protect the people we represent. The will of the American people should be stronger than the might of the gun lobby. Let me close by saying my heart goes out to the people of Las Vegas. Uh, to everyone across Nevada, to all of Americans. We're with you at this heartbreaking time, and some of us really want to work to prevent it from happening again. I believe there have been over 300 mass killings in this past year. That's when th more than three people are dead. And I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Slaughter. Uh, does any other member of the committee wish to be heard? Uh, I would like to uh, thank the gentlewoman for her comments, and with great respect to it, I'd like to say that uh, Title 15 of the legislation that the gentlewoman was speaking of would simply replace costly and outdated federal transfer for the process of weapon suppressors. For, to date, 42 states which control their legality allow for ownership with 40 permitting them to be done for hunting purposes. This provision that would be in the bill that she spoke of will have no effect on states that currently prohibit the ownership or use of suppressors. The mm. SHARE Act does not preempt the laws in any state and does not tell people what they would do 
with that in the case of the legality of the suppressor. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, my prayer is, is as I think about the victims of people who just simply went to a concert to have a good time and never made it home, is that that bill never comes to the floor of the House of Representatives. It's an insult to them. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Jim, Jim, sir. Yeah, and I, and I just want to associate myself with the remarks of a ranking member. And I think kind of her larger point is that, um, unfortunately, we are becoming uh, accustomed uh, to massacres in this country. Um, which is unfathomable to me, but it's becoming commonplace. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, our colleague from Georgia offering a, a prayer at the beginning of this meeting, and I, I assume that there'll be a prayer um, for the victims and those who are injured and their families on the floor. But uh, these moments of silence and these prayer sessions uh, seem inadequate and almost inappropriate um, in the, in, because that's all we do. Um, and we, we take no action on anything. And we just see these massacres continue to happen. And I think the families of those who lost loved ones in Las Vegas and those who are injured um, uh, are not looking for our sympathy or even our prayers at this point. They're looking for us to do something so this will never ever happen again. And I think that's where the frustration is, is that, um, you know, um, you know and, and the, the gentleman, you know, may have a different opinion on the legislation that Mr. Slaughter re referred to. Um, but when it comes to the issues of background checks or banning assault weapons or whatever, we ought to, these, are, these, these ideas are serious enough. They ought to be brought to the floor, and there ought to be a debate, <coughs> and people ought to be able to vote on them. And, you know, if you want to continue to vote with the gun lobby, you can. Um, if you have a different opinion, then you go on record as, as voting that way. But, uh, um, you know, we don't even bring these issues to the House floor for a debate. Um, and, I think, I, and I find that uh, to be a, a great concern. So I think people are tired of prayers and tired of moments of silence and tired of these, these rituals we go through to show that somehow that we, we, we're supposed to show that we care. When, in fact, if we really cared, we would actually take action and do something concrete to prevent this stuff from happening again. So I thank you, the Chairman, for yielding to me. But uh, uh, many of us are very frustrated at the inaction of this Congress. And, uh, and yet here's another example of, uh, of what that inaction means. More and more violence, more and more massacres, more and more innocent people being killed. And it's just it's horrific, it's heartbreaking, and it, it, it has to stop. I yield back. Yes, sir. Is there further statements any member would like to make? I want to welcome uh, this evening to the Rules Committee the gentleman, uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, Bob Goodlatte, a uh, man I consider to be perhaps the most awesome member of Congress uh, by his uh, reluctance to uh, accept nothing from mediocrity and everything to address the issues that's before him, and I'm proud of what he's done, and also the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, who will be here tonight to talk about H.R. 36. The gentleman, uh, without objection, I think the gentleman, each of the gentlemen having ready will be under the record. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here with uh, my colleague from Tennessee, and uh, I also appreciate very much the prayer offered by the gentleman from Georgia and the observations made by the chairman and by the ranking member and the gentleman from Massachusetts. This is a serious issue, and uh, it's one that we uh, need to learn more about uh, how this happened and uh, what measures can be taken to prevent it from happening. But I think there's an honest debate about how you go about doing that. Uh, turning now to the important legislation before us today, which will save many of thousands of lives every year, uh, I want to begin by noting that since the Supreme Court's decision in Roe versus Wade, the medical knowledge regarding the development of unborn babies and their capacities at various stages of growth has advanced dramatically. To give you a sense of how much technology has advanced, the issue of the New York Times announcing the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973 contained ads for the latest in advanced technology, including a computer the size of a file cabinet that you could rent for $3,000 a month that only had thousands of the memory of a modern cell phone and a basic AM radio 
that was as big as your hand. At the time, of course, there was nothing like the stunningly detailed images of unborn children that are so commonly celebrated on social media today. 35 years later, in the age of ultrasound pictures, the same newspaper reported on the latest advanced research on the pain experienced by unborn children, focusing on the research of Dr. Sunny Anand, an Oxford-trained neonatal pediatrician who held an appointment at Harvard Medical School. As Dr. Anand has testified regarding abortions, if the fetus is beyond 20 weeks of gestation, I would assume that there will be pain caused to the fetus, and I believe it will be severe and excruciating pain. A few years later, the terrifying facts uncovered in the grand jury report regarding the prosecution of late-term abortionist Kermit Gosnell contained references to a neonatal expert who said the cutting of babies' spinal cords intended to be late-term aborted would cause them, quote, a tremendous amount of pain. Congress has the power and the responsibility to acknowledge these developments in our understanding of the ability of unborn children to feel pain by prohibiting abortions after 20 weeks of pregnancy, post-fertilization, the point at which scientific evidence shows the unborn can experience great suffering. The bill before us would do that. It also includes provisions to protect the life of the mother and additional exceptions for cases of rape and incest. Some members of Congress have called this bill extreme, but such claims are clearly false, as evidenced by the polls, which show us <coughs> astounding support for this bill. On Election Day 2016, a survey by the polling company found support for this bill at 64%, including 65% of women, 63% of men, over 75% of millennials support it, as do 70% of African Americans. A Quinnipiac poll found that a clear majority of men, women, whites, blacks, Hispanics, married people, and single people support a ban on elective abortion after 20 weeks or earlier. Even 49% of the Democrats polled supported a ban on elective abortion at 20 weeks or earlier, significantly more than those who opposed it. A Washington Post poll found 66% support for this bill, and a Huffington Post poll found support at 59%. Today, America is one of only seven countries on Earth, including North Korea and China, that allow elective abortions after 20 weeks post-fertilization. These polls show the American people want to change that. In the 2007 case of Gonzalez versus Carhart, the Supreme Court made clear that, quote, the government may use its voice and its regulatory authority to show its profound respect for the life within the woman, and that Congress may show such respect for the unborn through specific regulation because it implicates additional ethical and moral concerns that justify a special prohibition, end quote. As we see from the polls, a majority of just about all demographic groups surveyed show the same profound respect for the life within the woman that this bill would protect. As the New York Times story published 35 years ago after Roe v. Wade concluded, throughout history, a presumed insensitivity to pain has been used to exclude some from humanity's privileges and protections. Over time, the charmed circle of those considered alive to pain and therefore fully human has widened to include members of other religions and races, the poor, the criminal, the mentally ill, and thanks to the work of Dr. Sunny Anand and others, the very young. Finally, I would note that it's rare for the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office to be so confident that a bill would save lives that it makes an estimate as to the number of lives that would be saved were the bill to be enacted. But the CBO did just that, conservatively estimating that this bill would save over 2,000 lives each year. It could save money. Uh, it could save many thousands more. Let that sink in for a moment. This bill, if enacted, would give America the gift of thousands more children with all the wondrous human gifts they will bring to the world in so many amazing forms, including their own children, for generations to come. I want to thank Judiciary Committee member Trent Franks for introducing this vital legislation, and I urge my colleagues to support it, if not on behalf of unborn children, then on behalf of the American voters you represent who overwhelmingly support this bill. And I really appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the opportunity uh, to share those thoughts with the members of the Rules Committee uh, and hope that you will bring forward an appropriate rule 
to help us pass this legislation into law. Chairman Goodlatte, thank you very much. Mr. Cohen, welcome to the Rules Committee. We're delighted that you're here and the gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm delighted to be here and I want to assure you I'm not for mediocrity either. And mediocrity sometimes comes in not following a regular order. Yes, sir. Uh, we, this bill, I'm on Judiciary Committee and I'm the chairman of the uh, ranking member on the Constitution Subcommittee. This bill did not have a hearing or a markup. And uh, the speaker talked about having regular order. Regular order is having committee hearings and markups. We have not had one on this bill in this Congress. We had it in past Congresses, but there's different membership. Um, the chairman in addressing this bill talked about medical knowledge, how it's increased in the last 30, 40 years, which I appreciate him bringing us some information about science that's been gleaned over the last 40 years, but uh, things like climate change have taught us a lot, and yet we don't listen to science, uh, some of us, when uh, it brings us information that's not comforting to our ears. Uh, the law hasn't changed, though medical science may have, and we're supposed to go by the law. We take an oath not to what we learn, particularly from some doctors, but we take an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade has not changed. It is the law of the land. It has been such since 1973. And this is a law that would violate that uh, Supreme Court decision of Roe v. Wade, which has not been overruled, and it's the law of the land. And it protects Americans from uh, unwarranted government interference in their most personal life decisions that I would think everybody here should be in favor of and support. Uh, but unfortunately, that doesn't happen. This bill is a direct attack on the rights of uh, women, but also on ungovernment, unwarranted governmental intrusion. It is patently unconstitutional. It shows disregard for women's lives and health and continues to demonstrate a near total lack of sensitivity for rape and incest victims. A lot of talk was made in the opening statement about photographs and fetuses and alleged pain. But none of that takes into consideration the real facts of this bill. Because that makes it, that's nice window dressing to try to appeal to the people's emotions. This is unconstitutional, and this bans all abortions beginning at 20 weeks from fertilization. There are only three exceedingly narrow exceptions. For cases when a physical condition threatens the pregnant woman's life, number one. Two, where the pregnancy resulted from the rape of an adult woman, but only if she received counseling or medical treatment for the rape 48 hours in advance of the abortion, and her doctor has placed documentation of such counseling or treatment in her medical records. And three, for cases of rape or incest against a minor, only if such rape or incest has been reported to the authorities and documentations of such report is placed in the victim's medical file. Basically saying we don't trust the women who make these reports and we need verification because we don't trust them. Make no mistake, H.R. 36 represents a direct challenge to Roe and a woman's constitutional right to choose to have an abortion. Roe and a line of decisions following it have made clear that prior to the point of fetus's viability, a pregnant woman has a constitutional right to choose. Mainstream scientific consensus is that viability does not begin until around 24 weeks after fertilization. Therefore, by banning pre-viability viability abortions, this bill impermissibly narrows the window within which a woman may exercise her constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. In short, unconstitutional, unless Roe was overturned, and it hasn't been. Another disturbing feature of H.R. 36 is it endangers women's health by containing no health exception and only a limited life exception. The bill currently contains an exception only for cases when the pregnant woman's life is endangered by a physical disorder, injury, or illness. The exception specifically does not include life-threatening psychological or emotional conditions, including suicidal thoughts, and does not cover even severe threats to the woman's health. The lack of a health exception potentially places a woman's health at grave risk. Most abortions performed after 20 weeks are done so for medical reasons, including cases where no medical treatment can save the fetus. Oftentimes, they're not able to be confirmed until after the 20th week. H.R. 36 would force a woman to carry a fetus, even when doing so would cause serious, long-lasting health problems for her, including certain cancers and even threatening her future fertility. The limited nature of the life exception and the lack of a health exception are constitutionally wrong, and I would submit morally wrong as well. Finally, H.R. 36 very narrow exceptions for rape and incest demonstrate a lack of sensitivity regarding these horrible crimes as well as a lack of trust in the woman's honesty. According to a study by the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, more than 32,000 pregnancies result from rape each year and rape-related pregnancy occurs 
with significant frequency. The rape exceptions in H.R. 36, however, are only available if the victim has first received documented counseling or medical treatment for the rape, or in the case of minors, reported it, the rape or incest to law enforcement. Even the Hyde Amendment, whose original author was a staunch abortion opponent, contains a straightforward exception for rape or incest with absolutely no limiting language. H.R. 36 narrow rape exception will fail to help many victims who will again be victimized by being forced to carry a rape-related pregnancy. In sum, H.R. 36 is harmful, insulting to women, and unconstitutional. And groups that are not necessarily associated with Democratic sides uh, have come out against this. The uh, National Women's Health Network, the National Women's Law Center, the Episcopal Women's Caucus, the Methodist Federation for Social Action, the Presbyterian Voices for Justice, the United Church of Christ Justice and Witness Ministries, and I won't mention the Jews, the Muslims, and the Unitarians that might not garner much support in this committee. This is a bad bill, an unconstitutional bill. It's come up in past Congresses and been pulled or changed at the last minute because the women on the other side of the aisle saw it to be wrong for women and wrong for this country, and I urge you to oppose it. Ms. Cohen, thank you very much. Mrs. Cheney, you seek time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, I, I just want to say that I uh, share my colleagues on the other side. Um, I, I share their horror and expressing um, that we all stand together with the victims of that horrific shooting. Um, I, I commend their concern for the sanctity of human life, and, and I only wonder why that compassion doesn't extend to, to the most vulnerable among us, the unborn. And, and I'd like to just, Mr. Chairman, read into the record uh, something that the mother of a little boy who was born at 20 weeks said last week in a press conference. This is a little boy born at 20 weeks. So that's, those are the babies that we're talking about. She said, when Micah was born, his eyes were still fused shut. His bones were not hardened yet. He couldn't breathe on his own. He was medicated to stay comfortable from pain. We were told not to touch his skin, as his skin was so sensitive it could hurt him and tear the skin. I was there to see his first set of hiccups, his first sneezes, and his first drop of milk placed on his lips. His first smile, his first laugh. He was alive, he was fighting, and he wanted to live. And Mr. Chairman, today Micah Pickering is alive. He is a healthy young boy. Those are the babies that we're working to protect. I want to commend Chairman Goodlatte for bringing this bill forward, uh, and I'm honored to express my support for the bill as well. Thank you. I Thank yield you. back. Thank you very much, Mr. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any questions of the witnesses. I just have some quotes I want to share with you. Uh, one is from a woman named Christy Zink, who testified before Congress about her decision to terminate her pregnancy at 22 weeks after learning that the fetus was missing half its brain. She said, I'm horrified to think that the doctor who helped us legally would be prosecuted as a criminal under this law, providing basic, safe medical care and expertise. And also, uh, I'm pleased that Mr. Cohen named all of the organizations, uh, not only scientific, but um, the religious groups that are against this. And one more quote that I, I must tell you I found really stunning, but it needs to be done. Sponsors of the extreme abortion bans have further exposed the true motive of exploiting women's personal private health circumstances for political advantage. After forcing a vote in 2012 on this DC-specific version of the 20-week ban, abortion ban, Representative Trent Franks predicted that his use of the wedge issue could result in political benefit for the anti-choice voting bloc in Congress. Quote, it will cost some people the election but it will cost more Democrats the election than it will Republicans, he said. I'm concerned that in very few districts in America will someone lose because they voted for this ban. And if that is the case, maybe they need a different district anyways, end quote. All 14 declared potential GOP presidential nominees signed a full-page advertisement in Politico, sponsored by anti-choice uh, group Susan B. Anthony List and Concerned Women for America. And by the way, as the representative of the district where Susan B. Anthony lived and died, there is some great uh, contention on whether or not she was pro or, or anti-choice. 
Anyway, calling on the House to pass a 20-week abortion ban, making the issue an anti-choice cornerstone for the 2016 presidential election. With the outcome of the election and the win of Donald Trump, we can intuit where he will stand after having said on the campaign trail that women who get an abortion should be punished. Bans on abortion care after 20 weeks are a blatant attempt to deny women their constitutional rights. These laws interfere in the doctor-patient relationship, the sanctity of which is a cornerstone of medical care in our country. In fact, there is no other medical procedure of any sort that we even make suggestions about in the government, much less make laws about. They are the latest attempt in the more than four decades long campaign to make abortion illegal again in America and, po and pose an extremely serious threat to the health of the women in the most desperate of circumstances. And I have had circumstances sometimes in my district when we talk about it that to say mostly to men who bring it up to me that uh, should their families, their wives find themselves in the awful circumstance because women are nurturers, they don't do this lightly. Uh, they do it because circumstances that are really none of our business pretty much. We don't ask why, anyway, as I said a while ago, it is simply not a Congress's business to pretend to be doctors, play doctors on TV. But anyway, the question was often asked of me of uh, what should be done, and I've always said that a woman and her family should consult whomever they please. That could be her religious advisor, her doctor, whomever she pleases, but they don't ever have to wait till Louise Slaughter gets there to tell her what the government thinks about it because it is frankly none of our business. I yield back. Joan yields back her time. Mr. McGovern. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was going to ask, um, you know, whether or not um, in, the, in the legislative hearing that the committee did, whether or not um, any doctors who provide abortion care uh, testified so that they could maybe describe for you reasons why a pregnancy might have to be terminate after 20 weeks, uh, but you didn't have any hearings uh, this time, and you didn't have, have a markup. So, um, uh, but I mean, but that, but that kind of goes to the heart of the issue why so many of us are opposed to this. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of a woman from Massachusetts, uh, a woman named Kate. Um, at the 18-week ultrasound, uh, the technician thought that she saw something indicating a problem with, uh, with her baby's brain. But at the level two scan, the technician found nothing wrong. Uh, Kate was nervous uh, and insisted on another level two scan during her third trimester. It turned out that her baby had multiple brain malformations. If the baby had survived, uh, her short life would have been filled with incredible suffering and pain. She would have had uh, she would have had trouble swallowing and breathing. She would have been afflicted by seizures, vomiting, choking, and muscle spasms. Uh, and so Kate. Uh, had an abortion. And she wants people here to know, uh, and I quote, she says, I believe it's my obligation as a mother to do whatever I can to make a terrible situation for my children better. And I did that for my daughter. I resented very much when politicians try to force me to carry a very sick baby to term and watch her die a slow and tortured death just because it fits there and not my religious sensibilities. And so when I hear stories like that, um, I realize that life is always not is always not just black and white. There's a lot of gray here area here, uh, and when we move forward on legislation like this, if it ever were to become law, um, it could make people like Kate and others uh, face uh, you know a terrible, terrible situation. Uh, and I don't I don't think I go back to what Mr. Slaughter said. I don't think that politicians in Washington should have the final say uh, on a very Difficult situation like the one my like the one Kate faced, and so um, you know again I you know I I, I think uh, at a minimum if you're going to bring a bill like this to the floor without a hearing or without a markup you ought to open this up um, so that people can amend it and maybe provide uh, different ideas on, on on how we might approach this uh, this issue. So um, uh, with that. Um, I, uh, I urge people, everybody here to vote against it. I, I hope we don't have a closed rule, um, especially without a markup and without a hearing. Uh, but with that, I yield back my time. Thank you very much. Um, 
there are lots of stories about families that encounter uh, difficulties and judgments and good news and bad news in babies being born and information that medical doctors have available to them um, has come a long way. I think Chairman Goodlatte referred to that. I want to be one that tells a story of, uh, of success. Uh, I don't think that my wife and I considered at all abortion. Uh, of, of, of a Down syndrome child. but So I, I really want to speak on the other side of the issue, and that is that the love, cherished love and opportunity that comes from all children is amazing to me. That I see children all the time, including this last weekend when I attended an event on Saturday night called Heroes. And I must confess that my son was what I would say middle of the pack in terms of a, a functioning disability. There were many who were there who I could tell were perhaps intellectually uh, at a disadvantage. Some who were profoundly impacted with an intellectual disability. There were some there with a physical handicap. I saw them smile. I saw the parents full of joy. I saw the parents who came up to me and hugged and kissed me, and I did them too, out of pride of authorship. Um, our children are amazing. Our children that are disabled uh, contribute. My son, Alexander Gregory Sessions, is an Eagle Scout. Thinks he got hired by Home Depot. We don't know yet, but he's been through training. And you've never seen a person more proud of a job. He's going to work in their home and garden section in Lake Highlands, Texas. Alex is 23, cannot read. But uh, an employer in Dallas, Texas, felt like he could rearrange the flowers and greet people and be value-add. It's hard to know how people view this. I simply know how I do, and I know how his mother feels. And I think I know how people feel. And I would like for it to be said that that's the side of this divide that I choose to be on. I choose to be on the side of a divide where he was given a chance, where we looked at um, God making a decision. I in no way would cast my viewpoints on someone who chose differently, who had more information than perhaps I did. He's my child, but he was an individual and a little boy that deserved a right. And he has done as much or more with his life, including pride of authorship of anything I've ever seen. And so I will just tell you that it's hard to, it's hard to know what's right or wrong. It's hard to know what's good or bad. But I am clearly on the side of allowing our children a chance where they have got a chance to give them a chance. And Chairman Goodlatte, there are those that are entitled to their opinion. And I encourage them to have their opinion. And there are those that want to vote, and that's good. But what I will tell you is I know where I am because my love and admiration for children that I see every day who are not perfect, but who present themselves in loving, beautiful, substantial ways is amazing. And I think occasionally having a few children that might 
not be exactly the way we would want them to be in our eyes are God's angels. And so, Mr. Chairman, I want you to know that I think I see your wisdom behind the bill. So we're a member that would seek time. Gentleman from Florida's recognized Judge Hastings. Good luck. Was there any reason you could not have held hearings? Was it a time consideration or sort? Well, it's, it is certainly uh, uh, in the Judiciary Committee a time consideration always, but it is also important to note that uh, we have indeed held hearings on this bill. This is not uh, a new bill before the Congress. It has come before the Congress before. We've held hearings before. We've had doctors come and testify. Uh, I, I think on both sides of uh, this issue, uh, I think it's been well aired, and I think that the Congress is ready for a vote on it again. Unfortunately, because the other body hasn't taken up this issue, we're revisiting it again, but uh, this is not an issue that has uh, not had a, a lot of close scrutiny by the Judiciary Committee. This is a new Congress. There are members here who were not in previous Congresses. You and I were, um, and... Do you have a recollection of how many times we voted on this, the same or similar kind of bill? I don't, I don't have an exact count, but it is, it is more than two. Yeah, indeed it is. Um, and in, in the last offering, there was a measure uh, that required uh, um, incest um, uh, uh, to be um, uh, reported, and it was pulled uh, because of that. Can you distinguish the last offering on the subject of incest from this uh, particular measure? I, I believe that this uh, has uh, changed that uh, reporting requirement. It doesn't. It's not required at all. <clears throat> okay. Yes. So um, two Congresses ago, I think, is the the measure you're referring to, mm -hmm. and there was a change in the last Congress. Uh, to language that changed that uh, reporting requirement, lesson the reporting requirement. Uh, so and uh, there is no change from the last... We don't require minors now to file a written report in this legislation? I believe that's correct. And um, insofar as uh, the science base, and Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask unanimous consent to include in the record the statement of administration policy. Without objection. In the administration's uh, policy... I lift from the second paragraph, third <coughs> sentence, or, or second sentence continuing into the third of the following. The bill, if enacted into law, would help to facilitate the culture of life to which our nation aspires. And I find that passing strange because if if it's going to facilitate all, uh, the culture of life, he goes on to say, additionally, the bill would promote a science-based approach to unborn life. So it's going to take the bill to do what the American Medical Association and what countless other OBGYNs and other scientists have brought forward uh, in uh, Roe versus Wade. I'd also uh, uh, commend to the president the number of children um, uh, that are in foster care, the number of children um, uh, that are uh, awaiting uh, adoption. Uh, we're promoting all of this culture of life. We ought to be about the business of trying to protect those children as well. And my good friend um, from Wyoming raised uh, uh, the question about uh, the care for uh, uh, the unborn. Um, in an equivocal manner as our care uh, for those who experience uh, gun violence. Um, I don't think that it's a good analogy uh, for the reason that 99% of abortions uh, uh, that occur before 21 uh, weeks in this country, and only 1.3% of uh, people um, who have abortions uh, after uh, uh, the 24-week uh, uh, period, which calls into play uh, the extraordinary work that physicians have to do in that category. Uh, but just to liken that minuscule number 
albeit very important, uh, particularly in light of uh, the various anecdotal information that is brought forward by uh, uh, many members. Uh, 33,000 people last year died of gun violence. Um, I, uh, uh, for one, um, I believe that we ought to be concerned about all of these things, but I also think we ought to find some guidance um, in the state of the law as we know it. Uh, Roe versus Wade uh, is um, uh, the established um, uh, Supreme Court um, uh, affirmation um, uh, that we uh, had uh, 40 years ago. Since that time, we've had all sorts of interventions uh, in our, our society, particularly in the field of uh, medicine. And it will be interesting, the court began its new session on yesterday, and likely there will be um, uh, cases, or at least one, uh, that will uh, allow uh, for the court to address uh, uh, the subject uh, again. Uh, my hope is and my belief is that the court will reaffirm uh, a woman's right to choose, which I thoroughly believe uh, uh, that uh, those of us in this body uh, do not have all of the expertise required um, uh, for physicians, nor uh, do we know uh, how it's going to impact our overall uh, society. I do know this. Uh, that the CB, CBO score just came out, and uh, it indicates, uh, am I correct, uh, Mr. Cohen, uh, that this bill would uh, direct spending by $55 million over five years and $170 um, uh, five million over 10 years. Um, and I guess uh, that that just came out. Did you see it yourself? No, sir. I can either affirm nor deny. Well, let me provide it to if, you. If I could, Judge, I'd like to ask the clerk, Ms. Booth, that she would please provide both of our witnesses with a All copy right. of the uh, Congressional Budget Office uh, cost estimate, H.R. 36, dated October 2nd, 2017. Ms. Booth, here's one copy, and the gentleman, Chairman Cole, has another copy. Oh, there you go. Thank you very much, Ms. Booth. And the reason I raise it, Mr. Chairman, and perhaps it's not fair if Mr. Goodlap nor uh, uh, Mr. Cohen uh, have seen it, but we will raise it again uh, uh, when and if a rule uh, is presented on this measure. And pretty clearly then, um, uh, the evidence from CBO suggests um, uh, that the cut goal uh, rule um, is going to need to be waived. And I'm always fascinated by waivers at the Rules Committee. Uh, those who rule waive when they want to waive. The rest of us, W-A-V-E, waive um, when they are passing us by with an opportunity to W-A-I-V, uh, I-V-E, waive. Um, I'd like to know if the bill requires doctors who provide abortions after 20 years to publicly disclose the location where care was provided. Um, and my concern, I repeat it again, uh, in case you didn't hear me, Mr. Goodlatte, and I'd like for you and Mr. Cohen to respond. Um, uh, does this bill provide uh, uh, for uh, doctors to have to disclose the location where care was provided um, in, this, in this measure for um, abortions that are performed uh, 20 weeks or thereafter? Uh, the answer to that question is only anonymously. Only, only? Anonymously. They do not have to make that information uh, available in a, in, a, in a manner that's discoverable beyond the, the entity that they report to. Mr. Cohen? Well, I'm not familiar with that, and I don't know how you'd anonymously do it. Anonymously, you don't need the name. What you need is the address. And if you have the address, you've got the potential for violence for, for people who have used guns to kill abortion providers which is, should be abhorrent to everybody. And if you give the address, that could be discoverable matter, it could be public record, and it could be identifiable and put the abortion provider in jeopardy. I thank you uh, both, and I 
uh, share uh, uh, the chairman's uh, very thoughtful uh, 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 concerns. It boils down to, in the final analysis, uh, and I've said this so many times in so many of these uh, matters, um, God ordained that women would have the responsibility for bearing children. And uh, quite honestly, I'm sometimes embarrassed um, uh, to even be a part of the discussion because none of us, not a man in this room, knows what a woman goes through uh, when she is pregnant. Uh, we can talk about pain, but we have to relate it to things like knees and teeth. Uh, and I suspect that any woman in the room can tell us it's an altogether different experience in most instances. Uh, also, most of us um, uh, don't have uh, the same uh, kind of um, psychological and psychiatric um, uh, problems uh, that women who are forced um, into situations where they are raped and or uh, where their father um, uh, may have impregnated them. And I find it uh, just abhorrent that a child would be placed in a position of having to make those kinds of decisions in a family uh, where uh, incest uh, has occurred. If God had been listening to me, then I would have told him, let's make this a 50-50 proposition where men could get pregnant 50% of the time. I suspect we would not be having the same discussion in the same manner uh, sure. that, we are, that we are having it. And therefore, I think for the most part, old men like me and many of you ought to butt out of this subject and leave it to women and their physicians um, uh, to go forward. And I don't think we should criminalize uh, that particular activity either for a victim of assault or rape or incest or for a physician uh, that deems it appropriate and necessary uh, either for saving the life of the mother or making a determination with a family about the need for an abortion after uh, 20 weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Chairman, you yield back to Sam gentleman from Oklahoma. Thank you. Just very quickly, I wanted to first thank you for your very thoughtful and very kind remarks, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I don't have any questions. I've voted for this bill. I just wanted to thank the chairman for bringing it up again. I feel very strongly about the issue. I do have one question for my friend from Tennessee, because I think I misheard you, and I want you to correct me, because I, I know I must have. But in the course of your testimony, did you suggest that you weren't going to present evidence from Jewish groups and Muslim groups and Unitarian groups that support your position because you thought we might not <coughs> regard them as of equal weight with the ones that you did cite? Sir, I did say that, and, and, and I said it for this reason, and that certainly with any pointed statement at any one of you, and particularly you who are a good friend and I respect highly as I respect others here, but I'm Jewish. And I know what's been going on in this country. And I saw Charlottesville. And I saw the president not get upset up by neo-Nazis who wanted to exterminate Jewish people and some people there who said they're there to kill Jews. And I've seen his position on Muslims and wanting to have a Muslim ban. And Unitarians, yeah, they're, he hadn't come out against Unitarians yet, but they're kind of on the liberal yeah. ilk. And I was saying that people that it, it tend to be on the liberal side, it's kind of like, you know, dog bites man or man bites dog, and you can expect the Jewish and the Unitarian and the Muslim maybe to be one place, and the, the Methodist, the Presbyterian, and the, and the Episcopal be another. Uh, I, want to, I want to disagree with my friend here on this, uh, and you are my friend, and I did condemn, by the way, what happened to Charlottesville, and I saw those things, and my friend's exactly right about hateful those things were, and they should have been condemned. But to suggest that this committee uh, would not take equal weight to the testimony of any groups, I think is unfair to this committee. I think it's unfair to the members of this committee. And it certainly doesn't apply to our chairman, doesn't apply to me, I don't think it applies to anybody on our side, I don't think it applies to anybody on my friend's side of the aisle. So I would just uh, take exception to that. If and you have a disagreement with the President of the United States, that's fair enough. 
and you can voice it at the president, but you, you aim that at this committee. And I apologize for that because I, it was wrong. My it was apology, it was wrong for all of you. And I guess I'm letting the president has painted a lot of people well, in your I, party with the broad I leave brush. My and, friends' disagreements with the presidents to my friend and the president. Thank you. Uh, but and I certainly accept my friend's apology. But please don't put me in that category again, and please don't put this committee in that category. No, I'm sorry. Would, would the gentleman yield? Certainly. Yes. I thank the gentleman for yielding because I'd like to extend that to the entire Congress because this Congress voted unanimously in very strong language to condemn uh, the actions uh, mm -hmm. in Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe, uh, I haven't checked, but I believe that that bill is, has been or will soon be signed into law by the same president that we're uh, criticizing. But I brought the motion on the floor of the House for unanimous consent to pass very strong language condemning what took place uh, in Charlottesville by members of the KKK and... Uh, uh, white supremacists and so on. So uh, I think we should move move forward. But I, if if, you, if you'd yield further, I'd like to uh, say a word about the the cut go provisions here and the 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 costs that have been alleged here. Because uh, if this committee were to uh, provide a rule that waives the cut go provisions, I can't think of a better time or a better purpose to do that than for this bill. Because uh, this is a very unusual CBO report. It actually estimates the number of children whose lives will be saved by this bill at about 2,500 a year. So over the 10 years that we're talking about, a few hundred million dollars, uh, it's estimated we're going to save 25,000 lives. Uh, and yes, those lives are going to need some uh, government-provided health care and other assistance. A few thousand dollars is all it comes to per child. I can't think of a better investment than to create life for 25,000 people uh, then uh, to address that. And I, I want to join you in thanking the chairman of the committee for his observations about this. He, we all have uh, our own uh, unique perspective about this, but the chairman has a unique and experienced perspective on this, and I very, very much value that. You know, I respect those who say that uh, they want to protect a woman's right to choose, uh, and if there were just one right involved here, uh, we might all respect that, but there's not just one right involved. There's two rights involved. Uh, one is an unborn child, uh, and the government has a responsibility through its elected representatives to consider what those rights are. And if the child uh, 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 were brought to term and were under similar circumstances, there'd be no question in the mind of any of us that we were going to protect that child's right not to have its parents, both of its parents, make a decision uh, that's uh, contrary to the interest of the child. So uh, when the child is uh, uh, now uh, with much scientific evidence that uh, children born after 20 weeks uh, uh, can be brought to term, uh, that uh, children born after 20 weeks can feel excruciating pain, uh, this legislation, I think, uh, is, is very respectful uh, of both of those uh, rights. Uh, and very appropriate for the Congress to speak on this issue. So I, I thank you for yielding, and I appreciate the opportunity to make that point. Thank you. Yield back, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Is there any other member that would seek time? Gentleman from Colorado. Yeah, you know, I, I'm just so disappointed um, that we're considering this bill instead of working to reauthorize the Children's Health Insurance Program or continuing funding for community health centers, both of which expired over the weekend, both of which would save lives. Uh, this bill will not save lives by restricting legal access uh, to abortions. It doesn't mean it decreases the number of abortions at all. It just means that what could and should be a safe, life-saving medical procedure can become and does become a dangerous, inhumane, uh, and expensive indignity uh, that can lead to the loss of life of the mother. Um, I, you know, I heard from a uh, person from my state that this has real-life implications for it, Dana. Uh, Dana had a routine pregnancy until her 28th week sonogram as she learned that her baby had severe fetal anomalies that could not be fixed or reversed or changed. Uh, and she received all the recommended prenatal care up to that moment, but her diagnosis wouldn't, couldn't have occurred any earlier. Um, and because her pregnancy was so far along, her only option was to travel across the country from uh, Maryland to my home state of Colorado where they could provide that. And uh, she was uh, you know, rushed to testing, consultation, decision-making uh, about the viability of the baby and, and a procedure that might be needed to save her own life. If my colleagues really care about improving outcomes for women and their children, 
we should really be talking about children's health insurance program, which hopefully members of both, the, both sides of the aisle can agree and save lives, community health clinic funding and save lives. Uh, for, for women like Dana and so many others across the country, uh, it's really important uh, that we don't pass this bill uh, and, and that we give uh, people the opportunity to have the care they need. I urge my colleagues to vote no on H.R. 36 to stand behind a woman's right to choose, and I yield back. Chairman yields back his time. Is there any other member that would seek time? Seeing none, I want to thank our witnesses uh, and applaud both of them for keeping cool under uh, pressures that we all see and have. These are difficult issues. Hope I accuse myself of the same. I want to be thoughtful about this, uh, about an issue that I deep, deeply believe in also. And I want to thank both of you for taking time to be here today to present your views before the committee. Please remember that we have an awesome stenographer that's available. If you'll please leave anything you brought in writing for her advantage, we would appreciate it very much, and I appreciate your attention and time today, gentlemen. Yes, sir. Is there uh, any other member that would seek to give testimony? H.R. 36, Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act. Chairman does not see where there is any member that seeks time. This will close the hearing portion of H.R. 36. Chairman would now be in receipt of a motion from the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Chairman, I move the committee grant H.R. 36, the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act, the closed rule. The rule provides one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the committee on the judiciary. The rule weighs all points of order against consideration of the bill. The rule provides that the bill shall be considered as read. The rule weighs all points of order against provisions in the bill. Finally, the rule provides one motion to recommit. You've heard the motion from the gentleman, distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Is there a amendment or discussion to that? The gentleman from Florida is recognized. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Today, today's closed rule uh, will be the 45th closed rule reported out of the Rules Committee of this Congress. Um, what that means is that 53% of all the rules reported out of this committee have been closed. Last Congress, um, you broke the record for the most closed rules in a single session with 48 closed rules. Um, Mr. Chairman, it appears that you're on pace to beat your own uh, uh, record of uh, uh, this Congress. And I'd like to remind my colleagues there have been zero open rules this Congress, limiting open debate on the House floor and restricting members from both sides of the aisle from having their voices are heard. And Mr. Chairman, the subject that I raised earlier regarding the CBO score, yes, uh, can you point me to uh, how this rule is handling that? Is it under waves all points of order against the bill or just exactly? Um, how is that working? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've been advised that the waivers will be discussed in the uh, accompanying information of the report that will be added to the rule. So then, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment to the rule. Yes, sir. And I move the committee strike the waiver of all points of order, which includes the waiver of our uh, cut go uh, uh, clause uh, no, referencing uh, uh, Clause 10 of Rule 21. Thank you very much. Further discussion? Seeing another vote, now be on the uh, amendment from the gentleman of Florida. Those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. I ask for a vote. Gentleman asked for a roll call vote. Clerk will poll the committee. Mr. Cole. No. Mr. Cole, no. Mr. Woodall. Mr. Woodall, no. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Collins. No. Mr. Collins, no. Mr. Byrne. No. Mr. Byrne, no. Mr. Newhouse. No. Mr. Newhouse, no. Mr. Buck, nope. Mr. Buck, no. Ms. Cheney, Ms. Cheney, no. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Ms. Slaughter, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. McGovern, aye. Mr. Hastings, yep. Mr. Hastings, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Polis, aye. Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, no. Clerk will report the total. Four yeas, eight nays. The amendments not agreed to, not agreed to. Further amendment or discussion? Seeing none, the vote will now be on the motion from the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma. Those in favor, signify by saying. Aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The ayes have roll it. Call, please, Mr. Chair. Gentlewoman asks for roll call vote. Mr. Clark Cole. Committee. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Cole
Mr. Cole. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Woodall. Aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Collins. Aye. Mr. Byrne. Aye. Mr. Byrne. Aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Newhouse. Aye. Mr. Buck. Yep. Mr. Buck. Aye. Ms. Cheney. Ms. Cheney, aye. Ms. Slaughter? No. Ms. Slaughter, no. Mr. McGovern? No. Mr. McGovern, no. Mr. Hastings? No. Mr. Hastings, no. Mr. Polis? No. Mr. Polis, no. Mr. Chairman? Aye. Mr. Chairman, aye. Clerk will report the total. Eight yeas, four nays. The motion is agreed to, and accordingly, the gentlewoman, Mrs. Cheney, will be handling this for Republicans. And Mrs. Slaughter will be handling this for Democrats. I know somebody's going to ask a question, so Judge, I'll look right at you and say, I know what you're thinking. Tomorrow, we will have a meeting at 3 o'clock p.m. on H. Conrad 71, which is the FY 2018 budget. 3 o'clock tomorrow. Further questions from the committee? Seeing none, we've now completed our work for the day.